Yeah, so this is Yang from Arizona State. Yeah, it's my pleasure to yeah host this talk with Chiu Si. Yeah, for Professor Yeah Wang Meng. So yeah, Professor Wang graduated from Tsinghua University and also Cornell in the past. Yeah, she has been active in data analytics, energy, and the signal processing. Yeah, and she also got the yeah, prestigious yeah Young Investigator Award from Army office yeah and uh, she is a guest editor of actually journal of selected topics in signal processing and also yeah information processing for critical infrastructure yeah so today yeah i'm very excited to yeah, hear about her pmu and also the yeah, low dimensional analysis which is a key for yeah, data analytics if you synthesize the data so yeah so professor Wang, thank you and uh, Please go go forward with your talk. Thank you, Yang. Thank you, Chou Shi, for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, PMU data analytics using low dimensional models. This work is done by my students, two has uh, graduated and two ongoing students, and we are also collaborating with Professor Chou Chao at RPI. Um, so essentially, the takeaway message of today's uh, talk is that although many data sets we are dealing with have um, a high dimensional, and uh, are, however, they have intrinsic low dimensional structures due to their correlations. And therefore, we could exploit these low dimensional structures to simplify many uh, data analytic tasks so that we can have fast methods to solve these problems and with analytical guarantees. <coughs> And today I'm going to uh, sh I show a couple of pictures to show you that these low dimensional structures actually are, um, are, uh, exist in many different applications. Um, when the, we are going to focus mostly on um, uh, power system applications. So the data we are going to use today uh, or focus on is um, one is PMU data. So nowadays we have more than 2000 PMUs installed in North America. Uh, sampling rate is about 30 or 60 samples per second, and they are usually multi-channel PMUs that you can measure um, voltage phasers, line current phasers, and frequency. Um, but there is um, some data quality issues about uh, this, uh, uh, the PMU measurements. Uh, we actually observe in practice that you, uh, you, some, uh, the operator will see data, data losses, and sometimes data errors due to the device issues of the PMUs, the, the scaling of the PMUs, or sometimes communication congestion. So with all these issues in this PMU data, it's not yet um, uh, incorporated into real-time control operations yet, although we may have some, some real-time uh, application and some offline application, but in, in terms of real-time um, control build upon PMU, it's still not there yet. And another kind of data we are going to uh, we are considering here is smart meter data, because the conventional SCADA measurements are only available at substation level. But now with smart meter data, we could actually know the um, um, know the fine grain fine um, data uh, power consumption of individual household. So that essentially enhances the visibility in the um, in the distribution network. And then again, this, there is some. Um, um, the dimensionality issue of these large amount of smart meter data and how we're going to deal with them uh, more efficiently. Um, so let me first show you an example of this low dimensionality. So in this talk, what I'm trying to show is that despite of this high dimensionality of PMU data or smart meter data, they have intrinsic low dimensional structures. And these structures are very easy to describe, do not need power system models. And we can use these structures to simplify many um, monitoring tasks. So this is one example of the low dimensionality in power system, i oh, sorry, in PMU data. So here we have the actual PMU data from uh, New Central New York. Um, these are installed, uh, six installed PMUs. Uh, they are multi-channel PMUs. We have 37 voltage and current phasers in total provided by these six PMUs. And then the second figure shows um, the event, uh, uh, event. Uh, these are the current magnitudes during that event. It is 20 seconds. And uh, when we collect all these data in these 20 seconds into a matrix, the dimension of this matrix is 37 by 600. 37 is the number of channels we have in these six PNUs. And uh, 600 is the number of data points we have in 20 seconds with a sampling rate of 30 samples per second. And then we compute the third figure, shows the single values of the resulting data matrix. 
And you can see it only has a small number of dominant singular values, while most singular values are close to zero. That is essentially due, due to the similarity among the data. You can see from the second one, clearly there is a strong correlation among the measurements. So essentially in this particular data matrix, the dimension is 37 by 600, but we can actually approximate this data matrix with a much lower rank matrix. In this example, if we only keep, uh, let's say, the largest eight eigen singular values, that means we can approximate the original data matrix by a rank eight matrix, and the approximation error is negligible. So this is one example of this dimensionality and has been used um, by exist the recent work for dimensionality reduction or uh, event identification, event detection. Here we are just going to, um, in this talk, we are going to use this low, low dimensionality for, um, for mainly two tasks. The first one I'm going to talk about is PMU data quality improvement. I'm going to show you that by just assuming using the property that your data matrix can be approximated by a low rank matrix, we can develop fast measurement uh, algorithms to recover the missing data and correct the bad data in real time. And by bad data I actually include the data resulting from device errors or resulting from cyber data attacks from malicious intruders. A second example I'm going to show you is that Using this low dimensionality, low, low, low rank property, we could actually enhance the data privacy while at the same time without sacrificing the data accuracy. So one example I'm going to show you later is that we can use this low, low, low dimensionality to enhance the privacy of this uh, smart meter data, while at the same time make sure that our operator gets the right measurements and um, can essentially uh, divide the users into a right group without actually knowing the detailed information of individual users. A third application I'm not going to mention today, but we have some other work to show you that if we can use this low dimensionality, we could develop event identification methods that are, are fast to implement in real time and does not require does not require significant amount of uh, historical data for training. So that essentially can simplify the machine learning approaches if we can use this low rank property. Okay, so let me first start with the first objective, which is uh, data recovery and error correction. So um, uh, this is actually one example, uh, the, the, these top three figures is one uh, example we get about uh, data losses. This is the data we get from uh, uh, NISO. So you can see all these vertical points actually correspond to missing data. So when there's missing data, it's set either to zero or some value. So that's why it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's set to zero or this is voltage magnitude. So you can see all these vertical points that actually go to zero. And um, all these, it also missing points happen across all channels, voltage angles, frequencies as well. Um, that also happens for other uh, data sets from other utilities. For example, in California, I, I also reported about 10 to 18, 17% of, um, of uh, data issues in 2011. And uh, here is one, uh, the, the, the bottom one is one example of our recovered data. So essentially from this, um, um, using this original data that contain a lot of uh, data losses and errors, we could use low rank property to clean that data in real time. Um, and this is another example. Uh, this actually, actually is the worst case. So here, I actually show you, I can actually show you here. So you see in this recovered data here, we, there's, it's not ideal. So there are cases that we didn't correct data. So that is because at this time, all the measurements at all these channels are lost. So that means at this time, we do not observe any information at all from all these measurements. So that can be more extreme. So this is the more extreme case I show you here. Uh, this is the um, data set we get from um, the three, uh, three, in three phases. And you can see in this window, this is a window about an hour. So in an hour, we do not have any measurements for, from all these three phases at all. So essentially, the question is, okay, if we do not have observations for some time, how are we going to recover it? If you think about it, uh, this is a time series, like the data from dynamical systems and the measurements are output of these uh, dynamical systems. And we have, we do not have any measurements from um, like at one time, I'm oh, sorry, we do not have any measurements from all the, all the sensors for some time. And then if we, if we want to recover the data, we somehow, we definitely need to correlate for the temporal correlation. 
for example, we want to see, okay, how our measurements correlate from previous uh, historical samples so that I can actually predict the measurements in this window, right? So the existing approaches usually require the modeling of the power system dynamics if you want to, uh, want to recover these missing points. However, what I'm going to show here in this talk is that by using this low dimensional property, low rank property, we do not need to explicitly model the power system parameter. We do not need to model the dynamics of the power system. So that means we do not need to do a lot of model estimation, parameter estimation, and we can directly just recover this data from, from the observation we have. So let me first start with a basic approach. So the basic approach is follows. So I have these measurements. Uh, I collect them into a matrix. It's across different channels, across different time. I have some missing points of course, uh, represented by the question marks. So the question is, OK, how I'm going to recover it? Because I know the data is, um, can be approximated by a low rank matrix, like I showed in the example, I can write this as a low rank matrix completion problem, which essentially is a, is a general problem. It started with a Netflix problem a couple of years ago, which essentially says in many applications, uh, the data matrix is low rank. And um, we have some observations. We want to recover the missing points. So it starts with Netflix problem because the rating matrix of users against different movies is a low rank matrix because that is, uh, it is the matrix is only determined by a few uh, factors in user preferences. You have some missing points, so you have some observations from user inputs, and we want to estimate the missing points. And that, uh, because this low rank property is so general and the problem can find applications in many other domains. So there is a lot of research in the past 10 years, more than 10 years, about solving this low rank matrix completion problem. Um, and then uh, one, one way to think about this one is that, OK, I have some partial observations. What I'm going to do is I want to search over all the possible matrices that are consistent with my partial observations. And then I'm going to minimize the rank of the um, matrix I get. Because the only information I know is that it is a low rank matrix, so I'm just going to minimize the rank. So the problem is easy to describe, but not so, but not so easy to, just, to solve. So because this rank minimization is, um, uh, rank minimization is a non-convex problem. So one way is to relax this. So here I show you a nuclear norm minimization, essentially relax the rank to the sum of the singular value, which is a nuclear norm, and it's a convex function. It becomes a convex problem, so you could use um, off-the-shelf shelf tools to solve this convex optimization. And, um, and I didn't include that's a huge literature about low rank matrix completion. There are other methods that can be implemented more efficiently and have analytical guarantees. But the point is, if, if you only know the matrix is low rank, the ground truth matrix is low rank, you can actually use this low rank matrix, low rank property to recover the missing points and grab that data. And there are applications in different domains besides the Netflix problem. There are also, uh, we can find applications in computer vision, remote sensing, and even low forecasting and um, market inference in power system. However, uh, so let me first mention what's the advantage of using low rank matrix, uh, matrix completion methods. First of all, uh, I have already mentioned that there's no modeling of the power system. As you can see from this approach, the only thing I assume is that the matrix is low rank, and that's it. I do not need to know the power system topology, power system parameters. I don't even need to know um, the, the dynamic model of the power system at all. And secondly, um, the, approach, the, the, the approach is guaranteed to recover the ground truth data. And on the very mild uh, assumptions, I'm not going to go through details, but in general, it is known that these approaches can give you the ground truth low rank solution. And third advantage is that usually we uh, um, in, in numerical experiments, these approaches can tolerate a significant percentage of missing data or bad data uh, in the measurements. So these are the nice features of low rank approaches, but there are also some um, limitations. So first of all, it do not model the temporal dynamics sufficiently. What I mean is that it do not treat, it, it's, it's essentially a low rank model that does not model these temporal dynamics. So if you look at this matrix I show here, uh, this is data matrix, which means uh, each column per, uh, includes all the measurements uh, uh, in all sensors at time one. And so this is the first column, second column is all the measurements in all sensors at time two, and so on and so forth. 
And if you think about it, the only thing I assume about this matrix is the rank, right? So if I randomly permute some columns, for example, I shift column one, uh, switch, uh, swap column one and column two, or swap column two or column D, it will give me a matrix that has the same rank. So it will still be a low rank matrix. But now if I look at each row, there is no temporal correlation anymore. It's, it's like randomly shifted in time. So in that sense, the low rank assumption, although it's a very powerful assumption, it does not capture these, these temporal correlations through the, through the columns. So as an outcome, so that, that is the limitation as I show you in the numerical experiments that these low rank methods cannot recover missing points if all the data are lost in all the channels. For example, if I lose all the measurements in time two, as you say, all the measurements are lost, and then low rank approaches cannot recover this column because it, it, is, it does not impose any temporal correlation of the same, uh, like column two with other columns. And then if you lose all the information in column two, there's no way it can recover. It. So essentially low rank just say, okay, if I have some observations in some sensors at time two, I can use some, I can use these observations, to try to figure out all the other sensors. But if all the measurements are gone, then there's no way it can recover it. So this is a fundamental limit. And uh, another limitation is that these methods are still uh, computationally expensive for large data sets. Even though it's a convex problem, you can solve it theoretically, but for large data sets, it's still very slow. So if you want to be able to recover the data in real time, we actually need to develop faster algorithms to implement it in real time. So our contribution in this topic are as follows. So we developed, uh, again, we still, we still explore this low, low rank idea, but we can develop fast algorithm to solve it. And uh, we, we have this, uh, still have the approval uh, guarantee. We can show that we can, uh, we can show that the approach can recover the ground truth data matrix. And we address the fundamental limitation of uh, recovering simultaneous and consecutive data losses or errors across all channels. So we use our, by using our approach, even though all the measurements in some channels, so in all channels are lost for some time, or all the measurements in some channels are corrupted by, um, by cyber intruders or contain errors from the, because device issues or communication issues, we can correctly correct them. And these app approaches are fast. So they can be implemented in real time. And there's no concern about computational complexity. And lastly, um, this approach can actually differentiate bad data from system events. So the reason I mentioned that is because when in, in, in streaming data, when an event happens, all the measurements will, will be different from their ambient data and deviate from their ambient data. And then if you think about bad data, it's, it's the same thing. If, if there's, there's some bad data, it will also deviate from the ambient data. So the, I, so the question is, how can we differentiate a system event from bad data in real time? So our approach can actually naturally handle that without assuming any, um, without any prior assumption about the system event. Okay, so these are the major contributions. Let me first, uh, let me go through the technical details. So the idea is actually simple. So we, as I mentioned to you that this data matrix is low rank. Right? I show that if you collect all the measurements at one time into each column, it will be, um, so, and then column one, time one, and column two correspond to time two, this matrix, this DMU data matrix is low rank matrix. I said that this low rank is, low rank property is a powerful assumption, but it does not capture the temporal correlation across time. Now, in order to, cap to capture this temporal correlation, what we did is a small change in the matrix. So we built a matched hanker matrix. So a hanker matrix is as for construct as follows. So in each column, instead of having all the measurements in all channels at one time, we have all the measurements in all channels for um, uh, cup actually it should be like kappa consecutive time steps. For example, in column one, that's from uh, time one, time two to time kappa, all the measurements in these kappa time steps. And then column two will be time two to time kappa plus one, and so on and so forth. So if you think about it, it's just an enlarged matrix of this original data with some repetition. So it's like this, this first block is like original data matrix, and then it's the um, data matrix shifted by one, by one time, and then by two time steps, and so on and so forth. 
So what's special of this Hanker matrix is that we are going to assume, use the property that this Hanker matrix is also low rank. So data matrix is low rank, I showed you. I'm going to show you in the next slide that Hanker matrix is low rank. But before I show you a new ex example, I want to mention that this low rank property of this Hanker matrix comes from this uh, linear dynamical system. So essentially, if your measurements are outputs of a linear dynamical system, you can use them to build a Hanker matrix. And the rank of this Hanker matrix depends on the order of this dynamical system. Uh, so this is the standard property in control theory. And the people have been using these uh, Hanker matrices to, uh, for system identification in control. But what we are going to do here is that if we look at this data, um, the data, you can view this data because, uh, and of, of course, power system is a high, very high dimensional um, co um, complex dynamical system. But after each event, it will only excite a few a small number of um, uh, modes. And then that means we can actually approximate the dynamical system after each event by um, reduced order in the dynamical system. And therefore, the, the rank of this Hanker matrix is the the order of this reduced order approximate. So in general, this will be very small. In essence, if we look at this, collect all these data, build a Hanker matrix, the Hanker matrix is low rank. And this is a very special property for a dynamical system. And that thing is, I need to mention here that it, it, it also applies to other dynamical systems, not just power system. As long as you can find a reduced order linear, a linear dynamical system to approximate your original system, you should be able to observe this hand low rank hanker property. So this, let me show you one example to illustrate this low rank hanker property. Uh, this is an event data set we have. This is voltage magnitude. And the figure on the bottom left is the approximation arrow to the original, to the, to the hanker matrix we built using low rank matrices. So I have all this data. I can build a Hanker matrix like I showed in the previous slide. And then I'm going to um, approximate this Hanker matrix using low rank matrices. So here, this X axis is the rank of these low rank matrices and Y axis is the corresponding approximation error. So what you could see here is that you can choose a relatively small, low rank, small rank matrix while maintaining a very low approximation error. And these different lines correspond to different kappa, which means how many blocks I have in these hanker matrices. Of course, the larger kappa you have, uh, the approximation error will be larger, but still it's, a, it's still very comparable small. You can still treat it as a low rank matrix. Now, this example is to illustrate the, the, the fact that this low rank hanker property is special for uh, dynamical systems. So what we did here is that we permute the time of the observation. So for this data matrix, we have it's, it's, we have all these time series, right? And then we randomly permute time so that essentially I randomly permute the column in the original data matrix. And then I will have uh, still the same set of data, it's just the time is shifted. Now I build a hanker matrix of this permuted matrix and then approximate it with a low rank matrix. And you can see after this permutation, the approximation error significantly increases. So that is because after I randomly permute the time, this temporal correlation no longer exists. That means that therefore the Hanker matrix is no longer low rank. So this is an um, example to illustrate that, yes, indeed, uh, Hanker matrix of the power system data is uh, low rank. Now, using this low rank property, low rank Hanker property, we can uh, still write this data recovery problem as optimization problem. So here um, we, we, uh, we consider both cases. We consider um, missing data and bad data. So we can, so here uh, we assume uh, the ground truth data is denoted by Y. So that's the ground truth data matrix that contains measurements across different sensors across different time. And then this S corresponds to the arrows. Uh, we do not impose any assumption. We just assume sparse. Sparse means that it, um, uh, we assume it only has at most S, um, it has um, um, only a certain percentage of the measurements can contain arrows, while most of them are, are clean data. So this is a reasonable assumption because we usually do not observe a significant percentage of missing data, oh, sorry, data arrows. 
And then we assume the M is our observation. So it's contain missing data, sorry, contain bad data. We also assume missing data. So this uh, omega set is the locations of our observations. So for observations outside these locations, we do not, we, we, we assume it's missing data. So we do not collect that. So the data recovery problem can be written as an this following optimization problem. So we want to find two matrices, uh, S, C is the estimate of the ground truth data Y, and S, actually I should not use S, should be different notation. Essentially, this is um, the estimation of the um, uh, arrows we have. Essentially, what I says is I have I have two constraints. One constraint says that the ground truth data should be low rank anchor. That's what we observe. And the second constraint says the arrow should be sparse. I only have uh, a small s number of non-zeros in this uh, matrix. So zero norm uh, measures number of non-zeros of a matrix. So essentially it says most of them are zeros, most of the arrows are zeros, but uh, some arrows are non-zeros, and the number of non-zeros is, is at most s. And then the objective is to minimize the difference of the uh, the estimation with my observations in the observation set in the location that I actually have have data. So you can see the problem is still relatively straightforward to describe. So I had used as imposed low rank hanker assumption on the ground truth data. I model some sparse arrows and then we want to be able to fit the observations we have. However, this problem is still non-convex. So we developed a fast algorithm to solve that. I'm not going to go through the details of this algorithm, but essentially it is an iterative algorithm. Uh, I have two stages of iterations. In the outer stage is we, we have a rank K estimation of the ground truth low rank, of the low rank hanker matrix. And in each uh, rank K um, estimation, we, we, we still, we, we have inner loop to gradually remove the, remove the uh, bad data. So essentially, overall, it's a gradient descent type of idea. So essentially, here is in each iteration, we first threshold some significant, uh, some entries with significant amplitude, treat them as bad data, and then after we delete them, they are be, they will be considered as missing data. Then we move along the gradient direction. Uh, gradient direction is actually easy. Just want to make sure it's close to our observations, and then we project it to a rank k matrix and then we project it back to um, original data matrix and so on and so forth. And then we gradually increase k from one to r. So um, I want to emphasize that first of all, this is um, great, um, first order algorithm. We only use the gradient information. We do not need any second order Hessian information. So in practice, it's easy to compute. The solution complexity is low. And secondly, we have these uh, recovery guarantees of this approach. So let me first go through these uh, results um, one by one. So firstly, we talk about convergence. So this algorithm, we show that it converges to the original data matrix linearly. So that means if we if you, you your if you yeah, so y is your ground truth matrix, x l is your estimation in l step. If you want to make sure this arrow bound is less than epsilon, the number of iterations you need is in the order of log one over epsilon. So this is very fast convergence compared with some existing results. Uh, uh, existing results, the number of iterations may be in the order of one over epsilon, while we can actually reduce that to log one over epsilon. And secondly, uh, we can tolerate a um, certain percentage of um, bad data. So here, the bad data we tolerate here is a fraction of one over R. R is a rank. If you think of R as a constant, essentially it essentially says we can tolerate a constant fraction of um, uh, bad data. And this can be arbitrary bad data. We only assume that the number of bad data is less than this uh, constant fraction. Other than that, we should be able to recover it. And thirdly, um, we also talk about the tolerance of missing data. So this approach only requires the number of observations in the order of R cube log n. So the dimension of this data matrix is n by n, so n channels across n time steps. So if you think about the, the total number of samples we have, it's actually n square. However, by using this low rank hanker property, what it says is that you only need this R cube and log, log, n, log n square measurements to determine the rank. Compared with n square, this is a significant reduction because if R is a constant, log n is much smaller than n. So it essentially says if you already impose it, 
a matrix to be low rank Hanker matrix. Its ambient dimension, its sorry, its intrinsic dimension, or its degree of freedom is much smaller than its uh, ambient dimension. So you do not need all the measurements. If you have significant percentage of missing data, you still will be able to recover it. And then I also mentioned that the low computational complexity fluctuation, the complexity is like linear in the matrix size. So it's actually very fast to implement in, uh, in real time. And lastly, uh, it can recover simultaneous data losses and corruptions across all the channels. So let me show you some numerical experiments. Um, so this is, uh, I think the event data set I showed you earlier that contains a disturbance. So what we did in this one is uh, for the voltage and uh, voltage magnitude and phasors, oh, sorry, uh, voltage magnitude and angles, we add significant bad data. We also delete some data points. We have some, quite some missing data here. Uh, it's like 40% of missing data. And then the bot, these two figures could, uh, are the results by our approach. You can see all the bad data cleaned up and the missing data field. And now this is another example. Here, I simulate a more extreme case. So this part circled by red is the case that all the measurements in all the channels are bad data. So essentially, for all these channels across this short window, I add bad data to all the measurements. The reason I want to simulate that is that I want to test whether this, our approach can differentiate this type of bad data with the event. Because when the event happens, you can see across a short amount of time, all the measurements in all the channels are different from their previous measurements. Right? So as the, the, this is the, our result. Um, you can see in, in online, it still like, leaves the event data unaffected, but still but clean all these significant data. So that's the, another um, objective I mentioned earlier is that our approach can differentiate that data with events um, without any prior assumption. Okay, so, so this is about uh, the, the um, uh, data recovery. And then I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about data privacy. But before I go to data privacy, I still want to emphasize the key point here of this, of this talk is that we do not want to model the power system dynamics or power system parameters because if we have errors in these parameters, then all the results will be wrong. The nice thing about these data-driven approaches is that we have these so large amounts of data and we can directly get our results from data. So that's what I showed in this example of data recovery. We only need the assumption that it's low rank hanker, and then we can just clean all these data issues. I do not need to model dynamics. I do not need to model the system topology. I do not even need to know how these PMUs are allocated. As long as they are the output of dynamic system, I should be able to correlate them and recover the data. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about the privacy, privacy issue of these measurements. So um, a intuitive uh, motivation of this uh, privacy concern is about smart meter data. So uh, smart meter data can provide measurements at, at, at a fine resolution for individual household, but there is also a concern about the, the, the user privacy. For example, there is an approach called non-intrusive node load monitoring that can actually identify individual appliances from the household demand. For example, if I give you this household demand in the red curve, uh, you, if you apply these approaches, you will be able to figure out, okay, this spire corresponds to what type of um, machine, for example, coffee machine or TV or toaster, or this type of uh, power consumption corresponds to what kind of uh, um, appliances. So by, by if, if you have these fine resolution, uh, like these fine measurements of this uh, um, of smart meter, you can actually figure out the, the user patterns and habits of these uh, individual households. So that is in, indeed um, indeed a privacy concern. On the other hand, for smart meter, although for PNU data, although it's not a pressing issue right now, but in the future with more uh, integration of um, cyber technologies and information technology into the grid, there is always concern about the cyber data attacks or this data privacy of these, uh, these PNU measurements. So the question is, okay, can we use these use this low dimensionality to enhance the data privacy while at the same time maintaining the accuracy. So the reason I mentioned that is because in literature, data privacy enhancement is achieved 
at the cost of sacrificing accuracy. So that's very intuitive, right? If you want to in, 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 um, increase the privacy level, that means you probably do not want to send all the information accurately. For example, uh, one way to enhance data privacy is to aggregate data from co-located customers. So instead of sending individual household power consumption, I'm going to send the aggregated power consumption of, let's say, a few of neighbors together. Another idea is to add noise. So before I send all the measurements, I add some noise so that the measurements you obtain, even if by a cyber intruder, is different from the actual power consumption. And uh, this noise can be added through either signal processing approaches or by physically adding a rechargeable batteries to the household. So in either cases, essentially the idea is that the data you send do not directly correspond to power consumption. It, but in that sense, it enhances the data privacy, but at the operator side, that decreases the information accuracy because now the operator do not know the exact power consumption of individual users at a given time. And then, there's concern about, okay, low disaggregation or pricing issues. So the question we want to address here is that, can we achieve both simultaneously? So we want to enhance the privacy in a sense that even if a cyber intruder has access to the data, it cannot directly figure out the patterns of individual users. On the other hand, for the operator side, we still want the operator to have the accurate power consumption of individual users. Okay, so this actually can be achieved um, but before I talk about technical details, I want to mention that what is the measure of information accuracy for the operator. So here at the operator, um, we consider two objectives. One is first of all, for sure, recovery data. So we want to know the exact power consumption of individual household. Secondly, is that we want to be able to cluster the data accurately. So for the operator, Suppose, let's say for the distribution operator, it wants to uh, cluster customers with similar load patterns together so that we can do load forecasting for each individual group of um, customers together and what we can to enhance the uh, forecasting accuracy or they can design uh, incentives for demand response for different types of uh, uh, customers separately. And it can also use these clustering results to identify abnormal user patterns. So, and for example, for PNU data, similarly, we can use this clustering result to identify anomalies or events. So we have two objectives. One is to recover the data from these uh, privacy preserving measurements. One is to, to be able to cluster data um, based on their similarities. So um, for clustering, I before I go to details, I first just briefly mentioned that there are different ways to cluster data because uh, you have different, we have different ways to define similarities among the data. So here we are going to focus on subspace clustering. So the assumption is that the data points um, in the same group will belong to the same low dimensional subspace in the high ambient dimension. So here this is a um, two dimensional subspace in the three dimensional space. Um, this each data point can correspond to a high dimensional vector. So each data point can be a low profile of one individual user. So these points in the same plane, the same subspace, says that users with similar patterns. So the reason we choose this um, definition is because um, they, you, you, in these assumptions, data points in the same group can be far away from each other. So for example, in this case, the data points can be here or even in there, but they still belong to the same subspace. So that corresponds to the case that the power consumptions at, in different homes can be at different power uh, level, but they may have different trend and uh, fluctuation patterns. In this case, if you just directly measure the, for example, the true norm of the difference of these two power consumptions, it can be significant. However, they actually have similar pattern. So that's why we want to use this definition that capture uh, similarities among um, users that, have that, that are at different power levels. So um, I'm not going to details about subspace clustering, but this essentially says if, okay, if I have many users, uh, each column corresponds to the power consumption of, um, of one user across time, and its, its column is a high dimensional point, is a high dimensional vector, it's a point in the figure I showed in the previous slide. If I can divide them into different groups, 
uh, with different colors that essentially says in each group, these users have similar, similar patterns. I have a way to find their group. And this way is to find a coefficient matrix C such that essentially the power consumption of one individual user can be written as a linear combination of the power consumptions of the uh, groups, uh, users in the same group. So it's because they, are, they belong to the same subspace, we have this, this linear correlation. So this C matrix is uh, block sparse. So these, at least in the same group, it is non-zero, but across groups, they're all zero. So essentially, the clustering problem becomes an estimation problem of this C matrix. If I give you the clean data, if I can find such a matrix, then using this matrix, I, I can actually cluster them, uh, the, the points accurately. So I'm not going to go to details. So essentially says if you if you have the ground truth data L, I can solve a problem. There are different ways to solve it. But if I can estimate such a matrix C, and then I should be able to cluster them accurately. However, but again, this is based on the assumption that you have all the ground truth data. The problem we want to address is what if I add something, add noise to my ground truth data to protect data privacy, how I'm going to fill the cluster. So our idea is as follows. So the, the privacy preserving part is actually straightforward. We still use the existing idea. So we're just going to add noise in the data before sending the data to the operator. So for example, if this is the actual power consumption of one individual household, we are going to, the, the smart output of smart meter will be, uh, first of all, it's at different power, power, uh, different power consumption and they are at, um, they are high, highly compromised. So how to achieve that is we can add noise to these measurements. You can add this noise through signal processing or you add noise by adding a battery. So you add noise to this power consumption and then quantize it to a few levels. So a few levels, for example, like here is a two level, uh, three level power consumption. So the reason to do that is uh, first of all, we, by adding noise, we hide the actual power consumption. Secondly, by adding quantization, we not only further higher the high, high, further hide the, uh, the power consumption, we also reduce the communication cost. We do not need to send all these raw measurements. We just need to send a highly quantized value to the operator. So this part is actually follows from existing approach to protect the privacy. Um, and also you can do the same thing for PMUs, you know, add noise and apply quantization before sending the data out. The key is at the operator side. What we are going to do is that we are going to develop a data recovery and clustering method for the operator so that it can achieve accurate recovery of the original power, pad, uh, power consumption pattern of individual households. And it can actually accurately cluster these uh, users into um, their corresponding groups. And one nice thing about this result is that this result will only be accurate for the operator that have enough samples. So for the operator, it has measurements from many households across time. And then by implementing our proposed approach, the operator can recover data accurately. On the other hand, for a cyber intruder, it can only access partial measurements. For example, it can have certain communication banks and then obtain the measurements in a few households, say. But in this case, even if the operator, sorry, the intruder uses our approach with this small amount of information, it still cannot recover the, uh, the, 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 the data or class of data accurately. So in that sense, this actually protects the privacy against cyber intruders while, uh, in, while maintaining the accuracy, information accuracy at the operator side. So now let me go through the, the, the approach. Um, so this is the problem formulation. So again, L star is the ground truth data, the power support power consumptions of different users across time uh, in each column, and they have different users, different users belong to different groups. So I have uh, five groups here. To keep the problem general, I also consider the uh, data errors. Again, it can be arbitrary errors from cyber attacks or some device issues. And then this is added noise. So we add noise and then apply quantization. Q is an operator of the quantization. Quantization, you can just apply any quantization rule you, 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 you like, just fix the quantization boundaries and then to a quantize to a few levels. So the Y here, Y matrix is the quantized measurements of the power consumption. So the question we want to address for the operator is for the operator, it only obtains this Y, right? These highly quantized values 
from different users at the time. And how are we going to recover the ground truth L star from these quantized values and how are we going to cluster them into the right group? So uh, the, we are going to model it as um, actually, okay, um, here is a, some related work. So this work is actually, this problem formulation is related with this so-called low rank matrix recovery from quantized measurements in study in the low rank matrix. However, all these work focus on low rank matrices, just low rank. So in this case, we are considering um, multiple, sub multiple groups. So the matrix of this rank might not necessarily be small. The, essentially in each group, the dimension is small, but I may have many groups. So this problem has not been considered before. And, um, and also there are different approaches, but one major concern is that whether we can have an approach that is both computationally efficient and that have theoretical guarantees. So to solve this problem, uh, we, uh, we, we write it as, as optimization problem. So essentially I want to estimate the ground truth ground truth data matrix um, uh, with L with L sorry, with L hat uh, and uh, estimate the arrow with E hat and C hat is the matrix I need for the clustering. Essentially it said, okay, I have this constraint. My matrix is it has this upper bound of this rank. It can be large, but I have an upper bound. And then the values is uh, has certain infinity norm, essentially it's uh, bounded, up bounded. And then this is a constraint for the same matrix as a constraint for the subspace clustering. I need to make sure that I can estimate the ground truth matrix and uh, such that it's corresponding matrix for clustering. Mean, meanwhile, my objective is to maximize the likelihood of obtaining these quantized measurements when I, um, quantized measurements when I, um, uh, if my estimate of ground truth matrix is L and E. And uh, this is non-convex problem because of this um, non-convexity in the constraint set. However, we are going to, we are, our results are from two perspectives. First, we are going to show that, okay, um, essentially we formulated as um, um, non-convex optimization problem, essentially with the constraint that I data matrix should be able to cluster into different groups. And I want to make sure that um, we maximize the likelihood of obtaining my observations under this uh, with the current estimate. So this is non-convex. So we are going to solve this, pro uh, address this problem in two aspects. First, suppose we can solve this non-convex problem, is the solution accurate? Is this solution going to give me the right estimate of the ground truth data and the right clustering of this data? Secondly, how I'm going to solve it? So for the first one, so this is our result. What we show is that if we can solve this optimization problem, get an estimate of L hat of the ground truth, the arrow of this um, L hat and uh, L star, average arrow here, is upper bounded by this value. That's the square root of D over N. So D is the dimension of each group. So it's uh, it's a small, what you can think of as um, constant. And M is a dimension of this, uh, um, the, the data matrix it can be a very large matrix and many with many users. So therefore, this M can be very large. So in, in, the, in the large for the operator, it has many users and many data. So this M is much larger than D. So this goes to zero if the size is large enough. And um, we also show that this result is otherwise optimal in the sense that for any approach, for any approach that you want you, you developed that you want to recover the data, cast the data from this quantized value, there are always exist a case that your arrow cannot be smaller than this number. So essentially our, our result is it has already achieved the optimal order of square root of D over M. So this is for recovery. We also show that for the clustering, um, the result is accurate. So if based on this obtained matrix C, we can actually uh, see that we can get the right clustering of this data into the corresponding groups. So this is about a theoretical guarantee. Secondly, is how are we going to solve this problem? So this is a non-convex problem, but we still we want to be able to solve it uh, efficiently in real time uh, so that we, we developed a um, proximal algorithm. So essentially, in, with iterative algorithm, in each iteration, we update different variables sequentially through proximal gradient descent or through uh, gradient descent. 
And the last theoretical result is that this algorithm can convert to a critical point starting from any initial point. So far, we haven't been able to show global optimality yet because it's a highly non-convex problem, but we can show that it go to a critical point. And the, uh, the complexity is low. The intuition complexity is linear in the matrix size. So uh, let me show you some numerical results. Uh, so this is some comparison with existing result for the low rank matrix case because the existing result only consider low rank matrix. What we are trying to show here is our approach achieves the smallest recovery error um, compared with all the existing ones. Uh, the more interesting one is here, the data on the on smart meter. So here we use the publicly available Iris smart meter data set that contains um, uh, many uh, uh, users. So here we pick a window that is uh, uh, in this time range, about a month of data, and then the, the number of data points about uh, 1400, and we also pick a similar number of users, 1400, and then uh, this data can be approximated by a rank 150 matrix with relatively small error. So what we did here is that you see this is the actual data that's the blue curve of one user. So we have the actual power consumption. We add noise to the power consumption, to, 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 the, to this actual power consumption of all the users and then apply quantization. So the third figure is the corresponding quantized values of this particular user. So you could see, so in these um, quantized values, the information are hidden. For example, in this user, it has two peak power consumptions at this time, but in this, a uh, quantized value, you don't see this peak consumption at that time anymore because we add noise and apply quantization, the information is masked. Now, uh, we collect all these quantized measurements from all this data and then run our approach and then test the recovery, uh, look at the recovered data. So this red curve is this recovered data by our approach. You can see it's not exactly the same because we have the, the data, input data has is highly noisy and quantized but we, will be, we are able to recover the dominant trend. So you see these two spike values of this particular individual user are actually accurately recovered. So this is a closer comparison of these recovered data with this 150 rank approximation to the data. So it's indeed very close to this uh, low rank approximation. Not, not the exact low rank, but this uh, yeah, 150 rank approximation. Um, I also will try clustering. So in this particular data set, because we don't know the ground truth Clustering. So we first um, try to find a right metric to measure a, a good cluster. So this is the cluster index. Essentially, it says the data points in the same cluster should be similar to each other, and data points in different clusters, different groups should be different from each other, and the, the larger the better. So this is what this index is trying to measure. And uh, here for this um, Data set we show that it has actually the four clusters. If you pick, if you try to divide it into four clusters, this index is maximized. So the ground truth one will be four clusters. And then uh, we have this highly quantized data, right? We have this quantized data. We run our method to recover data and cluster data simultaneously and look at the overall trend we get in each cluster. So you can see the red one is our recovered trend in each cluster, uh, while the, this, this blue and black one is the original trend in each cluster. Not exactly the same, but if for these cases, we, are, we will be able to follow the dominant trend. And by looking at the cluster index, we show that um, our approach, uh, complex cluster is um, the index, this, this is our in cluster index, and this is the ground truth cluster index. It's already very close to the uh, index if you can cluster on the data directly. And in comparison, so these are the methods, different clustering methods on the quantized data or even recovered data. It's not uh, directly, it's, I mean, it's not as good as our approach. So uh, to summary, so essentially what I uh, try to convey today is that uh, PMU data and smart meter data have low dimensionality. And uh, this load dimensionality result from this correlation among the data as well from the dynamics in the power system. And we do not need more, do not need to modeling these correlations. We just need to assume that data is low rank. And by using this low rank property, we can have fast methods to recover the data from this data 
uh, losses, data errors, or we can even enhance the data privacy without uh, sacrificing the accuracy. Um, and as some I've also mentioned that another another advantage of using this low dimensionality is that we can we can develop a event identification approach with a relatively small number of uh, uh, recorded data sets so that we do not need to train a very complicated classifier in machine learning. So that concludes the talk.